discover that all the concepts and judgments that we believe or take for granted are distortions of things as they really are. I realized that I was witnessing something truly remarkable. When we believe our thoughts instead of what is really true for us, we experience the kinds of emotional distress that we call suffering. When we don't listen, we come to accept this suffering as an inevitable part of life. It's not. It's not. It's not. It is American, homegrown, and mainstream. Rage, paranoia, and despair, and despair, and despair, and despair. Had some miracle occurred? There is an intense questioning about life and death, life and death, life and death. Allow yourself to be as judgmental and petty as you really feel. All of them are looking for the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. We are disturbed not by what happens to us, but by our thoughts about what happens, what happens, what happens. And as the thinking changes, the problems disappear. Loving what is becomes as easy and natural as breathing, not a quick fix. I have done the work many times, many times, many times, many times. I realized that I was witnessing something truly remarkable. Dimension. A dimension of insight. A dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is our planet radio. I think my intros to these shows are getting longer every week. It's another way of being late. <laughs> welcome. Good evening. And uh, welcome to Off Planet Radio Live for August 14th, 2013. My mixer setup's a little different tonight, so uh, trying to get the cues solid here. And uh, we are live at OffPlanetRadio.net, OffPlanetMedia.net, and OffPlanetRadio.com. And uh, I sound echoey. Gosh, what's that about? Okay, well, anyway, enough dallying about this evening. Um, we got a lot of stuff to do. Obviously, a lot going on right now. We have uh, very interesting things going on in the sky right now. We're going to talk about that in a minute when I bring Chris in. And uh, <clears throat> I will just mention the Perseid meteor shower has been spectacular here on the East Coast. Um, Sunday night, I was sitting out late night, almost midnight, and I caught a co uh, meteor come in that was just incredible i've never seen one this large this close it was probably about 2200 feet elevation coming in on the skyline and just zoomed across the sky a white hot flash uh quite amazing to see 
And uh, we have our guest here tonight, Richard Palmasano from the Searcher Group is with us. And uh, as well, we have with us my co-host, Chris Holly. Good evening, Chris. Hello, Randy. How are you doing this? Well, it's a fall night here in on Long Island. It yeah, is. it is the middle of August, but it's fall. <laughs> you know, it is so weird. We have been through three seasons in like very short periods of time. Um, it feels fall, but there's been times this summer when it felt like spring, and obviously, it's felt like it felt like summer there in July when we were uh, scorching like eggs on a skillet. But yeah, the seasons, the weather, the weather is really weird. Chris, give us a little bit of an update on what's been going on with you, what you're thinking about, what you're writing about, what uh, what's occupying your your attention these days. Well, I've been a little scattered with a bunch of different things, but the main focus that's been brought to me so that I, I have to look at it by other readers and uh, material sent in by other uh, researchers and, and writers that I know who are very kind in, in sending me a lot of this material is the fact that they all know I've been focused on the weather and I talk about it all the time because I find it so bizarre and they started to send to me the fact that they believe it's due to what's going on with the sun. I started to look into this and became well let's say frantic and terrified <laughs> our sun is not only you know going through a period of extreme tossing of uh, solar flares and it's 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 just having some it's like it's it's it, it's having a, a bad moment this summer or something it just can't seem to get its self squared away and then of course now I know why it's because it's going through its 11 year cycle where it trades or flips it's electromagnetic, I guess, poles is, is what it is, and uh, it, it upsets the sun. And with that comes massive amounts of changes to not only the Earth, but the, the solar system. And it's been, I am sure, what is causing all this strange activity in our seasons and cycles. Um, and that's bad enough because, like, we don't know what, what's going to happen next with winter coming are we all going to you know be sitting outside ourselves or freezing it, it, it's yet to be determined but what is being hidden or not spoken about or overlooked or people are too frightened to even glance at it is that that sun going through what it's going through right now is going to toss out some major major solar flares and um, cosmic uh, gamma rays out into the solar system and there is like no way I, I can see from what I'm reading that it's going to miss us. So the flares and some of the things that are going to be shot out from the sun are going to be like 50 to 70 times the size of the earth. Well, we can't get out of that way. The only thing that there is for to understand is how bad is it going to be for us here when they hit? Is it going to completely wipe out all the uh, electricity and um, communication devices in the industrial world? Or is it just going to hit one little section? Um, are we just going to have our satellite turned out? Or are we going to be living like it's 200 years ago? And that lasts for those who can survive that until we can repair things. I got so panic stricken. And I started to write about it again. And I'm going to, I wanted to wait till we spoke with Richard tonight because I, Richard is one of my favorite uh, interviewers. He's very different than other people that do the things he does. And I really, really like this guy. So, you know, I'm glad he's here. But um, I've been writing, please, people. I'm not going to give you, I did that before. I gave you lists of what you have to do. You know what you have to do to prepare. This is the time to do it because this is going to happen to us, these major flares, this difficulty with the sun, in the next, like, six months, with the end of August and September being a very, very fragile time, and then again in December, January. So this isn't over the next couple of years or, oh, eight months. This is just sitting on top of it. So if you did not yet 
get supplies in your house as if a storm is coming or, or you know, an attack of home state is coming. You have to have extra food, water, and supplies in your house to survive in your house for at least a few weeks. If this thing hits you bad enough for a lot longer than that, but do what you can now. Don't sit this out. This isn't a fairy tale. It's not to be laughed at. This YouTube's all over with experts explaining it to you. The government's talking about it. NASA's talking about it. It's real. And we're in, um, we're going to be seeing it, you know, happen to us in either a small way or a big way real soon. So that's been really on my mind, <laughs> as well. you can tell. <laughs> Well, I like to say this. We're probably the most vulnerable creatures in the universe, and somehow we're also so far able to survive the perils of living on this um, this small blue ball in the uh, in the in the galaxies. And uh, our guest tonight, while you're mentioning it, comes to us from a uh, a very interesting place. He is part of a very long term research group project called the Searcher Group. He has actually formed two companies related to paranormal research. The Searcher Group is the first, and uh, he also has a second company called the Canadian Institute of Parapsychology. <clears throat> He's written several books on parapsychological uh, subjects and has been featured in uh, television shows, Northern Mysteries, and Discovery Channel's A Haunting. He's worked in law enforcement, security, and surveillance for over 30 years. He is a trained investigator, and he joins us tonight from uh, Canada. And we want to welcome onto the line right now Richard Palmisano of the Searcher Group. Good evening, Richard, and welcome. Hi, Randy. Uh, great introduction. Thank you very much for that. We're uh, pleased to be here. Yeah, we're, we're kind of excited to talk to you because uh, uh, Chris has obviously interviewed you before and knows a great deal about your work, but looking through your website, um, i first struck by the long-term commitment to what you've been doing. Um, tell us a little bit about the formation of the Searcher Group back in 1979. Yeah, well, I've been doing this for almost oh, God, 35 years. Makes me old, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was raised in uh, raised in a haunted house, so it was always uh, always an interest of mine to find out what was going on. And uh, when I was uh, old enough to uh, do things uh, as an adult, I formed uh, formed the uh, searcher group, and uh, we've been investigating hauntings and uh, paranormal activities, uh, high strangeness uh, ever since. You have a team of people that work with you. Um, I notice a common surname here, so I'm assuming that Paul Palmasano is related to you. Yeah, that's my uh, actually he's my older brother. Okay, uh, he has a deep interest in this as well. He does. Uh, he, he's got a really difficult job. He's got to do all the uh, the analysis of all the surveillance we do because we use. Uh, uh, I, I am trained in surveillance, so we use a lot of surveillance equipment when we do jobs on uh, haunted locations. And this is audio and video. Um, so he's got to go through all that stuff and review every every frame. He's got to listen for every sound. It takes takes some uh, weeks to go through because we run, we figure four cameras who were there for eight hours. And then he's got to go through every frame of that. So it's, uh, it's a job I wouldn't want to do. But he, 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 he's like Neil Armstrong. He gets to see it first for anybody. So he's all excited when he finds stuff. Now, you have uh, you, any uh, members of the group that you want to talk about on air as being part of your core team? Because I'm looking, you've got uh, quite a few people listed on your website here. But give us a little bit of background on your team and how they work together, Richard. Well, they're all uh, different. Uh, they all have different techniques, and they're all uh, specialists in different areas. And that's it. this is what really complements the team. Is uh, not every, not any one person can know everything. So we rely on each other uh, to work as a team, bring things to the table, and say, "Okay, we're going to use this method, or we're going to try this." Um, uh, Peter, he's my he's my assistant. He uh, He's, a, he's an artist by trade, 
So he sees things differently than most people. You know, when they look at things, he, he's got that abstract way of looking at things, which mm-hmm. is really helpful. Um, our mediums, uh, you know, they're different, uh, different in each way. Uh, some are, are extremely powerful. Some are uh, not as powerful, but they, they, they have different abilities, like uh, psychometry, to be able to touch items and give you a back out background history on who's had that item, what it's done, things like that, where other mediums can uh, communicate uh, fairly easily with the uh, the dead and bring forward information that we can uh, then take, uh, we take that information, we try and verify it through historical records, witnesses, things like that, uh, maybe uh, living members of a, of a family. And try and uh, verify what the what the medium is telling us, because the medium can basically say anything they want to say. Until we verify it, it's not fact. So uh, we really work hard in trying to verify information and uh, look for two, three sources if we possibly can. Uh, sometimes that's difficult when all the witnesses to a to an event, you know, 100 years ago are dead, and there's just nobody uh, nobody available. Can, can I just step in right Absolutely. here for Randy for a while? The reason that I was so taken with Richard when I met him years ago and interviewed him is that I had been looking and had gone through some exhausting interviews with um, so-called ghost hunters. And I was very frustrated because it was obviously not a place I was going to find any answers. And then I was told about Richard, and I started talking with him. And immediately, I realized this man is different. First of all, he's been doing this for years. And he started to talk about how he does an investigation. And the searcher group and Richard, when they go and do an investigation, it isn't, let's up saying a six pack of beer and go out for an hour and run around in the dark <laughs> and do our investigation. He started to lay out a detail. I felt like I was back talking to one of my college professors, actually. He laid out exactly how he did, did it, how his team works. They have rules and like regulations and, and, and things they follow on every investigation. And then he said to me, I've done investigations that took a year and I whoa whoa, you know backed me up they really go into this and do it on a professional level and really try to figure out what's going on in there Richard is not a man that goes in for a good laugh and a ha ha and let's get tickled and scared to death he's out there and I one of the few in fact the only one I've ever come across so far really trying to figure out what's going on. And that's why I'm so drawn to, you know, what he says and what he thinks about these things. And um, I just wanted that to put that out there because he's not a ghost hunter. This man is a paranormal investigator, and it's completely two different things. Just keep talking to him, and you'll find that out, you know? So I'm... I just want to get that out there. Let's make that distinction, Richard, from the standpoint of uh, the difference between being a paranormal investigator and what is presented in many different um, aspects of the media, including film, TV shows, and obviously the uh, reality channels such as History Channel and places like that. What's the difference between uh, the, the prototypical ghost hunter and what you do as a paranormal researcher? Uh, I would say night and day. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I would, you know, the, the, I, I, look at, uh, I look at a lot of the ghost hunters as uh, typical thrill seekers. These are people that are, they, you know, they do a one-nighter. They go out there, they, they, they want to catch a voice or they want to hear something or maybe have an encounter and then but there's no research involved. It's, they take that away and they go, oh, wasn't that scary? You know, and there's no real research to it. There's no real uh, outcome. There's there's really no advancement. You're not taking that to advance the science. So you're, you're not doing anything with it. It's just a personal thrill seek. Where uh, our team, for example, um, 
we'll do a job that takes six months or a year. Uh, we finished the, uh, one of our last jobs was actually three years on the property. Uh, my first book, basically, that took six years because the, the, the investigation became so complicated. Uh, there was just so many doors opening up that the investigation went for six years. We're just getting answers for the family and and learning more and more about what what, uh, what occurred there. Uh, working with a, a very uh, very powerful medium at the time, he was uh, giving us so much information. It took uh, took months and months and months to to go try to verify all this information he was giving us. Uh, you know, it really really was a fascinating. Uh, Six years. Uh, I learned. I learned a great deal on that investigation. Uh, like I said, that was my first book. Uh, the work was actually. Uh, I guess it, it piqued some interest because uh, there was two documentaries made on that book. One was uh, from Discovery Channel, uh, New, Domin New Dominion Pictures, uh, a haunting, which was uh, Darkness Follows, and then a, a company up in uh, Canada uh, loved it and. Uh, they came down and uh, shot a documentary regarding it as well. So uh, we try and make advancements to further the research and further the, uh, our studies. Where a lot of these people, uh, if you go to the website, the website, there are good investigators out there, but the majority are just thrill seekers. You have a lot of people that won't even give you their names if you go to the websites. You know, like, are you going to get access? to your property, to do a proper investigation to somebody that's on their website using a nickname like Best Bunny 67. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. You know, I wouldn't like them in my house. So, <laughs> you know, you have to, it's a real commitment. You have to be, put yourself out there. You have to, you know, be uh, transparent. You have to say, this is who we are. This is what we, it's almost like going for a job interview and saying, here's my resume. This is what we've done and this is who we are. And, uh, you know, because you're going into uh, people's property or people's homes or uh, their business, you're conducting research. So there's got to be some kind of a trust factor, and you really need that trust between the client. I, we we call them clients. That's what they are to mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. and and ourselves. You know, um, we're working a couple of jobs currently, and uh, to talk about trust, we we go to the we go to the property, and the owner says. Here's the keys. Lock up when you're done, and they go out. They go. They go for the night, or they. Uh, one one family. They they gave us the keys, and they went up to the college for the month. So there's that real trust factor, you know. We're there for Richard, a reason. We're not there to. Yeah. Uh, just just also explain um, to the listeners how dangerous it could be to just jump into something. I mean, you are doing it right now with, you know, not knowing the property, and the, but other dangers to these fly-by-night, you know, four-hour ghost hunts where the people are totally unprepared and um, don't know what they're doing. You know, talk a little bit about the fact that, that that's dangerous. Well, that's absolutely dangerous. Um, you know, people don't realize it. They look at it as fun. They watch TV. They watch these TV shows, and they think, oh, this looks like fun, run around in the dark. Uh, a lot of them trespass, which just you know, really, really irks me that people trespass on other people's property. But they go in there, they don't, you know, they say, well, it's abandoned. Who's going to know? So they go into an old property. There are so many things that can go absolutely wrong. You're going into an old property, you are. You haven't maybe been there before. You're going in the middle of that. You don't know if there's holes in the floor. You don't know if the floors are weak. You're going to fall through a floor, get killed, get injured. You don't know if uh, there are uh, homeless people in that building. You don't know if there's people that are using drugs and alcohol in that building that you happen to come into the basement and oh look, hey now I'm in trouble because hey you got a you have a four hundred dollar camera and they need some more drugs. So guess what's going to happen? Or you run into an entity that decides, you know what, I'm going to have some fun with these people, and you don't know how to deal with it, because that can happen as well. You really don't know what you're getting into. Usually, you have to remember, dead people are dead people. They might have been really nice in life, and they'll probably be very nice in, their, in the afterlife. But there are a lot of people that weren't so nice in life, and they may not be 
uh, they may be the exact same way. They not, might not like you doing what you're doing. So you really have to, to, to have some real respect for what you're doing. You have to have respect for them. Uh, you don't want to create confrontation. Uh, I mean, there is time you have confrontation, but you have to understand how to do that and why you're doing it properly. Um, you know, I look at it this way. You're in a, you're in a house. Uh, you have to assume you're in a house with a bunch of strangers. You don't know nothing about, you don't know what their intentions are. So how do you want to present yourself? And that's key. Because uh, if you present yourself the wrong way, you pose a challenge or a threat to them, uh, they're going to come back at you. That's a very. I watched a, a show on TV where Ghost Hunter was screaming at a uh, ghost of a killer and laid down on the floor and dared the ghost to take this hatchet that supposedly in the past he used to cut up you know people with and smack him in the head with it. And I thought to myself, yeah. well, what's going to happen if he does that to you? You know, it, it it was such a terrible thing. And they showed this on TV to lots of like gullible young people and I, I didn't appreciate it. Now, now, Richard, these entities that you can have and possibly in the future many times again will encounter, they're not just like ghosts. You can't use that term and just say everything that you encounter is a ghost. How do you categorize what it is that over these 35 years you, you, you've come up, you know, against or seen or had to deal with? Well, there's, uh, yeah, there's, a, you know, there's varying uh, types of uh, entities out there. Uh, and it takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of work, you know, a lot of communication, a lot of surveillance work to find out what you're dealing with because they're not forthcoming. They're not going to, you know, they, they welcome you at the door and say, hey, this is who I am. Here's my business card. No, no, it's, it's, it's like pulling teeth. You really need to, to work at finding out what's there because they don't they don't automatically assume it's your business they just it's not your business this is not your house you're trespassing um so they make it difficult they're going to make it very difficult for you in most cases not not every case some some will communicate with you and say you know i'm so and so and i used to live here but in most cases it's very difficult to find out what you're doing with sometimes you find out that you're dealing with the wrong thing too late in the game. And what I mean by the wrong thing is, like I said, most, uh, most of these entities are, are just people removed from their physical body. So they're, they're in essence, uh, all their emotion and uh, memory um, that still exists, they have an attachment to the property or to, or to the dwellings, and they remain there doing whatever they do. Uh, you know, they go through their, their ritual thing every day. Sort of like we, we do every day. We get up and have coffee. Well, they, they can do that too. It's just not in a physical sense. But then there's other things out there that are uh, more sinister. And they have, uh, they have an agenda. We don't know what that agenda is. Only they know what that agenda is. So they don't come forward and say, Hey, you know what? I don't want you here because I'm doing some some sneaky stuff. They wait until you get uh, deep into the investigation. You've really, really upset uh, upset them because now you're you're upsetting their their plan, whatever that plan may be. And then they attack. That's where people get hurt, or worse, uh, they start damaging your your life. And not just your life, but the, the lives of, of people around you, people that are important to you, uh, family, friends, uh, work colleagues. And then that's, that's where, that's where the trouble, the real trouble starts. Uh, I saw the episode where, where that guy put the axe over his head. <laughs> and, uh, they come off like they're, they're, they're tough guys and they call, call out demonic stuff and they, they you know they go okay we're going to take on the demonic stuff but if you watch these guys they're starting to, to to learn that this is not the best practice because now there's areas where they're they're too afraid to go to 
they are coming forward now and saying that their their lives have been uh, disrupted, their family members have been disrupted, uh, their relationships have been harmed. And this That's is really how frightening. It is very frightening because you have an unseen force that are tormenting not only you but your family and your pets. And, and I've had that myself. Well, they, they'll come in and you know uh, bother, start bothering my wife, or they'll start bothering the dog, or uh, you know they don't get any sleep, and they're they're just causing all kinds of problems for you. And then your heart health starts to deteriorate, and this is uh, this can be an end result. They don't tell you a whole lot about this because. It's not good media. It's not good. Uh, it's not good for the uh, for the ratings. So let's talk about all the fun stuff and all the gizmos and gadgets because it's business. Let's uh, let's see if we can sell it off to the kids. Richard, what what do you think? What are these things? What are these entities? And and is is it just evil? Is it something from another dimension? What's what's going on there? They are evil, and they are probably from. I'm not 100 percent sure what they are or where they come from. I, I'm pretty sure that it's, it's they they do exist or coexist in this dimension at certain times. So uh, I know you're you're here in, in the uh, uh, unidentified flying object uh, spectrum. So uh, you'll understand what I'm saying. It will phase in. And then they'll phase out of our, our reality, and they uh, and that's what these things are. They they will they will not be there. We'll go into an investigation, and there's nothing there, nothing detectable at all. And then all of a sudden they'll phase in, and we're starting to hear or detect them in some manner. So it's it's like they have somewhere else to be, but they can choose to be somewhere else, or they can come come and visit wherever they wherever they're stationed. So it's like so a, a phone. Mm -hmm. It's a dimensional yeah. thing that they are coming in and out, and and in your um, experience, they're not very nice creatures. No, they're, not they're not all. here. Not to just they're, no. Yeah. No, their their intent is to harm. They, that's their only intent. They have. Uh, uh, they can be very creative at harming people. Uh, it's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a, a passion. That's you know, you just go around causing havoc and and, and people, and then they move on. Of it, once a, once I think that is decimated. Mm -hmm. it, it's very important that the people listening to this take this into consideration if they were, you know, planning to go do, uh, as I said, a weekend haunt somewhere, that uh, you could br bring something far more, you know, black and and uncomfortable back into your life and home with you. So, you know, really you have to know what you're doing when you're, you're dipping into these areas. The, 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 the spirits that, as you said, were just dead, you know, are dead people, um, that has an attachment. Do they also get like just attachments to maybe family members that are struggling or something and stay around for that? That's one part of my question. And the second part is, how does this shadow figure that I often hear about in um, ghost hunting fit into this whole spectrum? Hmm. They do attach themselves. They can attach themselves. Um, this is what they, you don't, know, we we use uh, food and water to sustain ourselves, and in my my opinion, these things use uh, uh, anguish and despair to nourish themselves. They just uh, they just thrive in it. So the more you're afraid, the more you're uh, depressed, the more you're you're uh, on the verge of uh, surrender. They just love it. It's it's a party for them. They just they can't get enough of that, and that's what they they live on. Um, shadow people are, uh, you know, I've I've seen a lot of uh, literature on shadow people. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, shadows that you know move around in my work. 
caught them on film. We've seen them physically with our eyes. Uh, we've seen some, you know, very strange things. Uh, twice we've seen uh, an entity that was uh, absolutely black, blacker than black. It stood out from the night. But on the, the other side of this entity, because we saw him in a cross view. So I was standing on one side, and my brother was uh, 25, 30 feet away from me, looking in the opposite uh, towards me, and it was in between us, which was uh, very odd in the first place because to allow something like that to get between us in such a short distance is very strange. But it did manage to get between us, and I saw it as all black. I mean, blacker than black. But when he saw it, he said it was all white. So it was almost like looking at a, a reverse negative. Huh. And I, I just can't. Yeah, I, it, it's very odd to me. I mean, we, we, you know, we encounter some things that are strange and then some things like that that I can't even start guessing about. I, I, I just can't, uh, you know, it, it was there, it happened, and but what do you make of it? I don't know. Um, these are the real we, frightening we, we, stories. <laughs> of, of, yeah, these of, are the yeah. These, these these are the memorable ones. Memorable ones that I I, I you know I come back to all the time, and it, it, it draws me to pause because it just I can't even offer a, a, a theory to it. It's just uh, it's just so strange. But uh, you know, I work I work the property that uh, the government was doing some cold fusion experiments. And um, we were seeing these uh, these black uh, black shadowy people um, on the property, where these cold fusion experiments went went on in the uh, in the seventies and early eighties. And uh, it was very interesting because the communication we were getting from inside the uh, state, uh, the spirits were absolutely terrified to go. They would not go outside where these shadowy things were. And actually talking to the team, because I never mentioned anything to the team, the team felt more comfortable being around the ghosts in the in the inside the house rather than the outside. So it was almost like psychological. They didn't know what was causing that fear. They just said, no, I'd rather be inside, even though we knew the place was haunted. So I brought in a couple of different mediums at different times, and they... They tried to read these shadowy things out there, and they said there's, they've never encountered anything like this before. They said these things were like just static, just white noise. There was no, there was no emotion. There was no feelings. There was nothing. It was absolutely nothing coming off them except static. And I think whatever they were doing in the, with the cold fusion experiments, I think they opened a, a doorway to another reality. Um, oh, you, wow. you, you have my attention on this completely. You couldn't hit two more su to subjects more interesting t to me than cold fusion and connecting it to these shadow entities. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, not being a physicist, I can't explain it in any way except to say that anything that is uh, theoretically creating um, a free energy flow is probably also right. operating dimensionally as well. I I agree. I, I really do agree. Um, these I think these things came through. I think they're very interested or or very curious. That's at least what we were getting from them. They were very curious at what we were doing. Always watching us, moving around, um, not communicating. I don't think they could communicate. I, it, nobody felt the sense that they could communicate with us. Um, they didn't act violent. They weren't violent at all. I mean, one of my crew members walked into one almost. Uh, I think she was uh, less than five feet away from it. She was going for a bit of a stroll on the property. It came out of the hedges, and she ended up face-to-face -face with it. The, oh. She looked at it. It looked at her. And she backed away, and it just moved back into the hedges. Like, okay, we're just going to part ways here. So there was, uh, there was no sense of real threat, but it was very strange on that property. Even though there was a cell phone tower directly across the street 
We couldn't get uh, cell phone activity on the uh, property itself. Cameras would fail. Batteries would drain out for no reason. Um, even the uh, when the book was done, a local uh, TV, quite a, a large TV station, wanted to do an interview with me. So, and they they like to go around and do it right from the site. You know, I guess it had ambiance or whatever. And they said, we're going to come down and do it there. We have all the satellite uplinks and all this stuff. And I said, well, you we can try. And uh, they came down and they set up all their equipment. And, you know, they couldn't get a satellite uplink. They couldn't get a, a cell phone call out. They couldn't do anything. So we had to go down and do it at the uh, at the station itself. And he couldn't explain that. And, and, you know, when you bring a truck with a million dollars worth of equipment on it and nothing works, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you sense that they, they were intelligent, these things. They they weren't just um, balls of energy. Just, there was an intelligence to them? Oh, there was a... I felt there was a real intelligence. They were uh, very curious. Um, they weren't... I didn't sense there was any threat from them at all. They looked, yeah. uh, they looked like an average human male. Uh, I'd say about five... Between five two and five five, uh, they had the, the form, perfect form of a person. Except that form was absolutely black. There were absolutely no features within the blackness. But you could see the outline was was humanoid. Wow. Did you say earlier um, that the people who were on the site? did experience a form of fear as a result of this these beings they, well they they were they sensed something on property that they didn't want to encounter okay and they 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 preferred to be in in the haunted house as opposed to being on the outside in the open which was very strange but a lot of the information we got from our surveillance equipment and our mediums dictated that the, 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 the spirits that were haunting the house were afraid to go outside. Oh, no, so that's interesting. Oh, yeah. W what was haunting the house? Old family members, or what was in the house? Um, it was a young child, uh, the, uh, the owner of the property, a female. Um, there was uh, her butler... There was a cleaning lady, and there was another gentleman, and they were they they all haunted together. Uh, the greatest relationship in that haunting was uh, a lot of the EVP we got was um, uh, the child's name was Danny, and the butler, whose name was Henry, and Henry was somehow was started watching this kid. And that's all he did all day long and all night long was chase this kid, Danny. He would call him Danny Boy, and he would go, Danny, come down here. Danny, come over here. And it was just on and on and on. And we got so many great EPs out of it. But I felt so bad for this guy because this kid was just running him ragged. <laughs> Jeez. That's, talking about the, the, the equipment you use, um, what do you think? I watch TV and there's a ghost box where they've got a ghost in the box. And um, oh, yeah. the thing that really is kind of, I don't know what's going on with this, is the little machine where no matter where they go, mm -hmm. the ghosts talk to them. And like right. they ask them questions and they give them sentences back. Is that any of that factual or is, do you use this type of thing? What do you use? And is that stuff you know, silly. <laughs> well, some of it's silly. Some of it's pretty good. Uh, we use the, uh, what you're, you're referring to as the spirit box, SP7. What that does is it scans um, through, you can pick AM or FM, so if, whatever, whatever you pick, and then it'll scan through all those frequencies and say the AM or FM dial. Um, they only stay on uh, each channel for about a quarter of a second and it produces a, a, a background white noise so as it scans it's producing all this white noise and it's allowing opening up all these frequencies 
we find that it, it, that particular item works uh, fairly good um, because we'll we'll be getting we record these sessions and we'll be getting uh, full sentences now in the same voice. So over if you're getting three or four words in a sentence over uh, say two or three seconds, well, you're looking at how many frequencies have you, have you, or how many radio stations have you traversed in that amount of time at a quarter second per channel? So, which is impossible. You should not be getting the same voice in, in a sentence over that frequency. It's, an, it's virtually, should be virtually impossible, and that's why it's paranormal. So, that system works pretty good. Um, and, and the other one you, we're experimenting with. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but Richard, have you had a conversation? Like recently, could tell us about whether you actually had a in the same time you having a conversation with a, a dead dead person. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, we just <laughs> uh, a project. Um, it wasn't so much we were having a conversation; we were asking questions. Yeah. But in the background, there was a, a, a couple of different spirits, and they were having a conversation regarding oh. us. Oh. They were sort of making fun of us actually and this we were recording the session and we recorded it and um, you can sort of hear it and make it out while you're doing it but it's so fast and it's so full of white noise that it's best to record it and then put it on a, a, a system where you can analyze those sounds and voices um, properly um, something like uh, Sony Sound for SoundForge or something like that and, and so you can really look at, at what's going on there um, but, uh, yeah, there was these two gentlemen and they were having a, a, a bit of a, a laugh at our expense, you know, they were uh, sort of just making fun of us and making fun of some of the questions we were asking. And, uh, so it was, it was, it was kind of interesting that way, but there's other equipment out there that's just, we've experimented with it and we just don't, uh, we just, we just don't use it. It's just not, uh, it's just not good stuff. Uh, we and, and, with uh, mostly cameras and uh, recording systems that are that that prove to work. Uh, you know, microphones that are are geared to uh, 15 hertz. Uh, most microphones will work around 20 hertz. We like to get a little deeper, so we like to, to get a modifier our microphones to go to about uh, 15 hertz. It, it, Richard, I I get so. I get like very confused here now, and, and mm -hmm. see if you can explain this to me. All right, you're in in a you're in a, that house with this going on. Right. Now I know that it takes you all your equipment and lots of patience and lots of time for you to try to communicate with these spirits. But right. how isn't it hard for them too? I mean, are they just, are they, can they see us as soon as we get into their area? And, yeah. um, but we can't see them. So they have the upper hand. Yes, they do. They, they see us. Uh, matter of fact, we try and make our plans, uh, prior to going because we've discovered when we get to a place and we make plans outside the front door or, or in the living room, well, they're standing right there. They're already, they're going, okay, that's not going to work because I already know now. So we try and make our plans prior to going. Uh, we go in, set up where nobody talks. We don't give them anything. Uh, usually our, our, some of our, our best work is our first visit, uh, because they don't have a clue what we're doing. And we just come in, set up and just, sometimes we'll just leave. We'll just set up our equipment and walk out the front door. And then they start chatting. They're very social. So they start talking to each other, like, oh, did you see what that guy did? Or what's this thing he set up over here? Or, or somebody will recognize him, go, oh, you should get back. It's a camera. Or <laughs> it's amazing some of the things they say. But how come, they, uh, you know, I, I get it that they are there and they are in their space and, and time, but they can see what we're doing. But how come it's right. so difficult for us to see them, well, not everybody, mediums, I guess, see them equally as they see see us, you know, but but right. the average Joe, we, we just, we don't know. Is it that we shut down to it, 
there's something different between the um, science of where they are and where we are that they can see all of it, our time and theirs, but we're stuck just... We, we, I get so confused here. You know, wh- why is it like that? Right. Well, I think they see when, once, you, once you pass on, I think you see in a different spectrum. You're more of an energy now, and you, you see in that energy spectrum. And even though we're living, we produce energy. So they see our energy signatures. They know we're there. They can hear us. So I think that's what the separation is. Is uh, oh. you know everything everything is frequency, and they they're they're tuned to our frequencies. They can see our energy signature, but we're not wired that way. We can't see their uh, into their spectrum of energy, so we don't we don't perceive them all the time. Uh, it's only when they get really emotional uh, that they'll start to manifest, and that's when we see them. Or, and mediums that they can see them any they have the ability to adjust or reach over or their gift is that they don't struggle with that like people right. do is that correct well right that's right well their brains are wired a bit different than ours um, I developed a, a medical test for for mediums we can actually uh, test a medium on their validity by using uh, EEG. Uh, hooking up to brain wave patterns and watching their brain wave patterns. Um, when a medium does what they do, which is connecting with the afterlife, they will actually shift their brain wave pattern from um, normal operating uh, frequencies, which are usually around you know 28, 30 hertz, down into the sleep mode between four and six hertz. But they're still awake. They're still animated. They're still talking, which is an impossibility. You should be laying on the floor, you know, snoring a couple of Zs. They're not. They're in that sleep zone, but they're still animated. They're still talking. They're still aware, but they're making communication. And that's what I'm saying is is the difference between us and them is it's frequency. There's a there's a barrier. There's a, that veil, and it separates us. It's and it's all about frequency. Yeah, that's interesting because I interviewed a medium once and that's exactly what she did. She was talking to me and then when she started to cross over and discuss something with a a, a dead person that was visiting um, us, she seemed to be like more like in a trance where she was talking Mm -hmm. and saying it, but she wasn't talking to me anymore. She was just talking. And um, I, I, she was like, like not aware that I was sitting with her anymore. And I yeah. noticed that right away, that she was somewhere different than where she was a few minutes ago and certainly not with me anymore. Also, right. why is it that investigations seem to be always done at night? I, I have to tell you, I've had a few experiences over my lifetime and they they were not terrible. One one was a bit odd. It was a horse and a Indian. I saw at my friend's horse farm that that really upset me. I lost control of my bladder. It upset, it upset me so much because yeah. I didn't expect it. But then the other right. ones were I saw like my mother and my grandfather in my lifetime, and I wasn't frightened at all of those. But they all took place around five o'clock in the afternoon. It, right. it was daylight. And um, mm-hmm. why why is it always that when you see a ghost hunt, it's always they go back in the night, so they're there at two o'clock in right. the morning. Is it better then, or is that just for effect? I, no. I don't understand that. Yeah, ghosts are twenty four seven. You know, they just don't come out at night like the vampires. But uh, no, they can, they're twenty four seven. They're always around. Um, a lot of the TV shows needed for ambiance. You know, if you're running around in the middle of the day, nobody cares. But uh, we do it mostly at night for two reasons. One, it's convenient because uh, that's when the place is quietest. And nighttime is, is, again, not as much traffic. There isn't as much people wandering around, dogs barking. So it's, it's, it's convenient in the sense that it's going to be a lot quieter for us. Mm-hmm. And 
we can get in and, and, and do our work. During the day, it's so hectic, it's so busy. You got traffic and phones ringing and people everywhere, and it's just, it's, that's why nobody really, unless you're by yourself, you don't really encounter anything during the day because your, your brain's running at the max. You're, you're nowhere near the frequency where you're going to make communication or contact with anything because your brain is, first of all, running, uh, it's trying to solve all the, all the problems of, of your life for that day. Uh, yeah. The phones are ringing, the kids are crying, the dogs are barking, the, you know, the, the couriers at the door, you're just like, holy smokes, you don't have time to deal with dead people. At night, when you come home and you unwind, you kick off your shoes, you put your feet up, and the house is dead quiet. Now your brain's starting to quiet down. Now you're becoming more aware of your surroundings. That's the time you're going to have an encounter with something because you're becoming more in tune to things. Do you, do you turn the lights out when you're in a strange house at night, or does that matter no. at all whether they're on or off? The, no, it doesn't matter at all. I leave the lights on because I don't want to trip down the stairs or bump into a dresser. So I leave the lights on. It doesn't really matter. We get so much activity, and we don't run around in the dark. So uh, they're there. They're there. And uh, that's why that's why I don't get these people. They go from place to place looking for ghosts. Uh, I can't even I can't even wrap my head around that. If I went to a place and I got an EVP of something, <laughs> you're bet you better bet I I'm gonna be there again tomorrow because I know there's something there. I want to now now I know I have to know who is it. Why are they there? What's their story? I have to solve that. I'm not going to get an EDP and go, hey, that's cool, and then ignore it and go find another place to find out if I can get another EDP from somewhere. That doesn't make sense to me. I can't even wrap my head around that activity. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Randy, I see that uh, we're moving right along. Before I start questioning Richard about other things, do you want to... Um Step in here. Yeah, sure. I uh, you were doing such a great job. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Richard, was about uh, preparation and protection. And be, I'll, I'll preface it by saying this: listening to what you just went through, uh, for instance, talking about the mediums and talking about what leads up to going into the actual site to do investigation. From the standpoint of each of your investigators who are on the ground. What do you do to prepare mentally, emotionally, and physically, and your state of mind? I would imagine that you want to have fairly neutral energy walking into a situation like that. So can you give us a little bit of background on preparation, emotional state of mind, and protection? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to be honest, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, wow. uh, we, we get a job, we go do the job. It's uh, We don't... You know, other than preparing my equipment and making sure I have fresh batteries, um, that's all the prep I do. Uh, I have my own belief system. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, born Roman Catholic, uh, so I have my my own faith and belief system. But you know, I didn't. Have, I'm not one of these people that sits around and goes, "So okay, I got to envision the white light, and I'm going to surround myself with gold." And I don't do that stuff. I just, you know, it's a job. I go do it. Uh, I want to investigate. So, other than, like I said, other than prepping my equipment, I don't really uh, do a whole lot of that stuff. I don't. I've never seen. Um, I've never seen anywhere where that stuff's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to work with a group that uh, they used to do all that stuff, the white light, and the, we're going to do a little ritual thing and. I said, yeah, okay, I'll see you guys inside, and I just go do the job, and they do their little protection ritual, and then they come in. And on one of the jobs, we encountered something that was extremely uh, evil. And uh, I don't work with that team anymore because that team fell apart. It's a, they couldn't uh, they couldn't fathom what they had encountered. It wasn't part of the, any any belief system that they ever had. So when they encountered this thing, it was so devastating that that whole that whole team just fell to pieces, uh, emotionally, physically. They couldn't. They just don't do this stuff anymore. They can't do it anymore. So I don't know. Did it help them? I, I don't think so. 
Um, but I'm still going. I, I didn't prepare. Richard, I encountered the same thing. So, yeah. What do you? How did you get rid of and your team members the terrible things like that that would attach to you and start, you know, torturing your your wife or your dog? What did? How do you get rid of it? Well, I don't know if I have. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh my God! Um, how do you repel it? I just it? shut a. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the, if I have or not. Um, I just shot. We were working a job, uh, which is actually going to be my next book. Um, but I had to shut it down early, just for the safety and protection of my uh, my team mm-hmm. and myself, uh, because we were starting to near the end of the investigation. There, we were starting to encounter things that uh, weren't good signs. And what I mean by not good signs is. Um, we were starting to encounter smells like uh, stale urine, uh, human mm. feces. Um, we were starting to, to uh, record strange laughters, and things like that. So these were not good signs. These were indicators that something else was taking place. Um, two of the mediums uh, reported seeing little gray uh, kids. Now, the reports were they are trying to appear like children, but they are not children. Actually, they aren't human. So that was a very strong indication that we were getting involved with something we shouldn't be getting involved with. So I shut the investigation down and called it uh, called it quits there, uh, just for our safety. Because once you start seeing these signs, you, you need to you need to have an exit strategy, or you're you're going to be in trouble. Wow, that 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 is frightening. I, I would have to always have adult diapers with me, Richard, if I went on some of your <laughs> investigations, because I would not hold up well at all. You know, you're telling me these things. Um, uh, Randy, uh, yep. do you think we should uh, give we're gonna, we're gonna Richard take a, a break here? Yeah. Cause we're just talking him to death. Yep, we're going to take the uh, <laughs> one-hour break, give you about uh, six or seven minutes to take care of business. The other side of Off Planet Radio and uh, talking with uh, Richard Pomisano from the Searcher Group. The next hour ought to be very interesting indeed. This was definitely, um, wow, I heard some things on this interview I didn't expect to hear, so hopefully we're going to hear more. We'll do that on the other side. We'll be right back on Off Planet Radio.
genetically modified foods, toxins in the earth and air, chemtrails, and escalating radiation levels, how do we get control? Thanks to the work of a team of researchers, we are pleased to announce a revolutionary natural technology that can help your body rebuild its original coating. RNA Drops is a complement formula based on the newly discovered iCell. RNA is the building block of DNA. These new DNA structures are the gateway to what is called ascension. Many users of the RNA Drops have discovered the benefits of a product as unique as their own biology, finding newfound well-being, peace of mind, and a sense of control over their destiny. Like me, they are enjoying a sense of empowerment within their own bodies and emotions. To get all the details on RNA Drops and to find out how, you can obtain a free mini bottle. Go to RNAgenesis.com. That's RNAgenesis.com. Another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is off planet radio. Welcome back to hour number two of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins with Chris Hawley and our guest, Richard Palmasano from the Searcher Group. And uh, as usual, phone lines are, um, well, they're a funny thing. We go to talk to somebody and they're not there anymore. And uh, as well, my voice is kind of under the weather tonight. Uh, allergies the, the weather here has shifted as much as 30 degrees over a couple of days it started getting very cool it now feels autumnal out there and uh, consequently um, all kinds of things are flowering and blowing around in winds that are running 15 miles an hour right now very very interesting stuff just a reminder next week Billy Booth from UFO Casebook will join us and we're going to finish out the month on August 28th with uh, Don Schmidt and Tom Carey. The Secret History of Wright Patterson, the real story behind Area 51. And um, that should be uh, a new addition to the tome of ufology in terms of actually addressing Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which is in Dayton, Ohio. Um, it's kind of been in the backdrop of the Roswell story for a long time so that will take us up to the end of uh, August and then we take a break over the Labor Day weekend and we will return in September with more shows and more guests and with that I want to bring back my guest and my co-host Chris Holly and Richard Palmisano welcome back guys good to be back thanks Randy yeah thanks Randy um Richard, before we get into, of course, I have more questions. You can believe that. But before we go there, um, could <laughs> you tell it. us <laughs> what are you um, working on right now? And you know, you you have a current book. Tell us about what's going on about your book, and of course, how everybody can find you and your 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 books. Oh, uh, great! Um, yeah, I'm currently working on uh, a couple of new books. Uh, one's just about finished. Hopefully that'll be out uh, uh, in the spring of next year. Uh, the working title is uh, Meeting Place of the Dead. And that's uh, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, that's the one I had to pull the team out of. Um, I'm also currently working on, a, on another book right now. Uh, this one's very exciting because we, we got, have a photograph so amazing um, of a spirit that is uh, physically manifested itself so solid it looks like a real person. Now, oh, wow. uh, I, I've never seen a photograph like this in all the years I've been doing this. Um, it is uh, so
so vivid that we're actually going to shop this photograph around uh, the town we're working in in hopes that somebody can identify who this is. And if we can verify who this is, uh, that is one uh, fascinating piece of evidence. And we'll be bringing yeah. that forward uh, once we verify it. We need, you know, of course, I need more than one one source. I need a couple of sources to verify this before I'll, I'll move forward with it. But uh, uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, Was it a young man or an old man or...? A uh, young woman, actually. She, oh, a young she woman. Like she, yeah, she looks like she's probably in her early, early thirties or late twenties. Uh, she's wearing a plaid shirt. Uh, she's uh, she appears in a photograph uh, with myself and another teammate. My brother actually took the photograph. He was photographing uh, myself and, and James, who was uh, my teammates. We were looking at uh, James's camera, and my brother just happened to shoot that photograph. And she's standing in front of us, uh, but there's no room to stand there because there's, there's a pillar, a solid uh, concrete pillar there. And she's standing there. There's also two other entities with her. You can tell that the other entities are, are definitely deceased. Um, they, they come up. My brother calls one of them Frankenstein because he's, uh, he's got the jagged hair and the black eyes sockets. He looks kind of, uh, kind of creepy, um, but she is is so uh, solid. Um, I mean, I had to look at it for half an hour, and I'm like, I'm trying to picture who this might be. I'm like, is this one of the team, or is this like? Because it was so solid, it was. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. So hopefully, we'll be bringing that forward uh, within the next few months. Uh, you know, like I said, we need a couple of good sources to verify. This, now, this tell everybody how, how they can find your group and where they can go to buy your books. Yeah, any any good bookstore, Amazon, uh, will carry them. Uh, chapters here in the, in Canada. Uh, to contact me or to to look at some of our work and uh, some of our photos and things like that, uh, you can go to. Uh, Get us on our website, which is uh, www.thesearchergroup.ca. So, searcher group, all one word, uh, .ca. Great. And, and I'll make wants sure. To contact us. Yep. Anybody who wants to contact us, uh, drop me an email or uh, leave me a message there. They can do that on your site. Absolutely. Great. I'll be sure to put your books up on my site also. I'll find them on Amazon for you, Richard. Yeah, because they've got to be great. Um, This woman, you know, she was so solid in the other ones that weren't so fresh as a daisy. I'll put it that way. I I, I would take it that if you were in a town or a city or just a place where there's been life going on and it's been an established area for some time, that we must all be walking around with spirits all the time unless we are like out in the wilderness yeah right yeah they're all around us uh we're surrounded by um and it's you know i i developed a theory uh actually the simpsons took my theory and did an episode uh on it uh season 19 (laughs) episode 9 um where uh, they take our uh, my my theory on the uh, memory bubble and uh, had some fun with it, but uh, the uh, what what I believe occurs is uh, I'd say a good ninety percent of uh, people that pass on uh, they develop a, what I call the memory bubble within the it's called the memory matrix. And what happens is you take all your memories, all your emotions, and you build a reality based on that information. And life doesn't skip a beat. Everybody that you want to be around you is around you. Being it doesn't matter if they're living or dead. It's your memory of them that manifests around that individual and makes that reality real for them. And that bubble can be so far removed from our reality that we'll never perceive them. They won't perceive us. It's not a problem. Uh, The ones we do perceive are the ones that are 
uh, obsessed about things, frustrated, angry. They were a victim, or they were a perpetrator, or they were uh, some form of, uh, of negativity that draws them closer in, in frequency to our reality. Those are the ones that investigators like us or, or um, people who encounter spirits are contacting or seeing from time to time. And those are the ones that we usually get a call on because they're, they have a story to tell. They want to hide a secret or they want to tell you, Hey, you know, uh, um, you know, so and so took all my money and I had a, you know, horrible life and I want to whine about it for a, a while or whatever it is. So, you know, they're, they're the ones banging around or they don't like what you're doing in their house because, you know, they put all their blood, sweat and tears building this place and now you come in and paint the walls purple. And they're upset about it, you know. So those are the calls we usually get. What about like, as I said, my mother um, likes to visit, and but right. she visits um, when you're in trouble. Frankly, when yeah. something's going on, she wants to warn you. She does, and um, is that common with like mothers or fathers or you know, um, with Absolutely. your children that yeah they don't leave you. Yeah, you have, then, uh, you know, when you have a deep love for somebody, um, and you feel you're in a position where you want to help them or protect them, uh, watch over them, then absolutely, you see something coming and you go, you know what, it's going to be a big problem, and I got to warn that person and give them a heads up. And sure, they'll come to you. Uh, sometimes the message isn't always clear. You might have to, you know, ponder it for a, a, you know, a while to understand, okay, what, what, what do they mean by that? But there, it's it's more common than most people think. It's just a lot of people don't even see it. They're, they're just not open to it. Yeah. And how come when, like, my mother warned me about something that I was totally naive about at the time, just like last year this happened, and I was talking into a disaster and didn't know it, and I just saw my mother, and she just shook her head at me, no, when I was going to move forward with this thing, and I knew that was it. And then the whole thing exploded just about the next day and fell apart. Um, wow. But when my mother, uh, when I see her, she can only get gray. Is that common? It's my mother. It's her figure. You can see through it right. and everything, but it's like a whitish gray. She never has any color or substance to her. Is that no. common? Yeah, it's just, um, she's probably coming from, a, uh, like I said, they build their own reality, so she's probably coming from, uh, uh, if you can imagine, long distance. Uh, oh, I try to be funny or anything. It's just, when you have a good, re uh, when you build a good bubble, for example, where, where everything is, is, you know, you're satisfied and you're happy, that is moved even further from our reality, because it's a place of peace. It's it's a, it's a joyous place. So when I'm saying she's coming from a long distance, she's coming from that that place that she's happy in, all the way back here. Just to one me. Huge, yeah. Just to, just to say, hey, don't go over there. What's wrong with you? Yep. Yep. That takes a huge amount of uh, of concentration and energy. Uh, so she's not manifesting fully. Um, where, uh, as opposed to somebody that's even closer to our reality, they don't have a, a huge distance to come. Then they can put more energy into manifesting, to, to creating uh, situations with the living. Where she's, I feel she's probably coming from, uh, from a longer distance because she's probably more in a happy place. Yeah. So that girl you saw may have been like, I tell, how can I put, freshly dead or. Not too far, sticking around. Is that why she's so solid and colorful? She, she could be, and uh, she could be a victim of something. Uh, we we fully don't understand what's going on. It's only our second time at this location. Yeah. So we're trying to sort it out. But what's really, really, really wonderful about this, and I can't give you the name, but she gave us her name. Oh. In electronic voice from us. So not only do we have the picture. We have a first and last name. So I feel that we're going to be able to move forward. And this, it's, this is one of the most exciting things ever to, uh, to come past, uh, come past us like this. It's just, uh, 
uh, I can't tell you how excited this is because I've never seen anything like this. This is a truly, true sense of communication. Uh, you know, they actually, she gave us the first and last name of and a photograph like that. It's, uh, this, this could be, uh, a, something else. Mm-hmm. If do you she's think what? she's pos- a possibly a missing person that wants you to find her? Or, or get across the fact that she's, you know, w- was maybe murdered or something like that, and that's why it's so strong, because she was so young. It could, yes, it could very well be. We don't know at this point. Um, this could be maybe the topic of uh, another radio show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we really, uh, yeah, we'll have that you know, conversation. We really well, I, I'd like to have you back <laughs> when that book comes, finally comes out, and you can flesh that out a little bit more, Richard. Oh, absolutely. I'd be pleased to. I have an interesting question that came up here on our chat, and it actually goes off into something that I was thinking earlier. Um, The question is, is there a limit for how long a discarnate spirit can hang around? Um, They they write, we tend to think that ghosts are in older areas, but now that I think of it, I can't really remember ever hearing a story about any ghosts from someone who's died more than two or three hundred years ago. Right. Good question. Um, you know, we haven't, uh, not that I know of, we haven't made any contact with, uh, with Neanderthal man or, or, or things yeah. like that. But we have seen reports uh, out of, out of uh, Europe, uh, Italy, uh, with uh, Roman legions. So Roman legions were going back, you know, at least uh, 1,500, 2,000 years. Um, so... I don't know how far well, back we can given go. The fact that, uh, given the fact that, and I, this was my comment on the chat, I mean, from my standpoint, from my perspective and understanding, even working in spiritualism, um, there really isn't any time outside of what I guess we call this, this, this life stream that we're in. We live in time, but there really isn't a time limitation, per se, on spirits, no. as I understand it. No, well, time is man-made, right? Right, right. It's a perfect answer. Thank you. Yes. Right. So I don't think time, you know, time doesn't seem to... We, we've got a lot of EVPs where it almost shows the reverse. Uh, we're standing in a house in the living room, 10, I think it was like 20 after 10 p.m., and we got a mother telling the kid to eat their lunch, and the kid's giggling, and you can hear the glasses clinking and everything. So nobody's eating their lunch at ten after or twenty after ten p.m. Right. So they perceive it as early early afternoon. Uh, we've got a lot of things like that where where it's almost like a, there's a reverse. They're seeing it. We're we're there at night, but they're seeing it in the daytime. Well, we're there there in, in the daytime, and they're seeing it late at night, where they're telling us it's time to sleep, get out. So it's uh, it's very strange. So I don't think there's a perception of times per se, uh, except that they have a memory of what time should be, and, but they're not. You know, there's no official timekeeper. Richard, this, this you don't hear a lot about it, but enough about it. Black-eyed children, or the black-eyed kids, mm-hmm. that people right. are you know talking about. Do you think that that's more of some kind of entity or creature or something that manifests into that um, rather than like actual like you were coming out of a UFO or something like that. Do you, do you think it's more of um different yeah. mentional well, thing? Read, I, yeah, I think that's what we're looking at. Uh, you know, I've read uh, quite a bit of literature on, uh, on these things and uh, now we we did have these uh, little gray things that were trying to manifest and look like children, but we're not children. But we're taught. I think that's something different. I think these black eyed kids are more your specialty, and I think you're, yeah. uh, you, we're starting to get into the extraterrestrial, uh, interdimensional type of being, where they're just not sure what they're supposed to look like. But they're trying. Right. They're, Im- they're trying to imitate humans and doing a terrible job. 
Another yeah. thing that's a crossover between you and I, but I've been having a terrible time with them for like the last year from people reporting them and seeing them myself are orbs in all different mm -hmm. from huge craft size things that might be something completely else to, you know, every hunter has pictures of orbs. And mm -hmm. um, wh what's going on with that is from your perspective? Oh, there's different types of orbs. There's uh, what we call in uh, ghost uh, hunting. Orbs can be, um, you know, there's a variety. There's dust. There's moisture, which we we just just throw in the garbage. We don't look at that stuff. But then, then there's orbs that are um, things that we can't readily explain. Uh, things that are uh, have energy to them. Have uh, a solidness, a very uh, vivid color uh, that uh, move in unusual ways, not following any uh, wind or, or, or any pattern. We actually have an orb that's yellow. It's uh, on camera. It's probably about the size of uh, a small orange or a tangerine. It's moving uh, across the room, going towards a kitchen, and then decides to turn uh, left 45 degrees and then go upstairs, which now it's it's flying on an incline, which matches parallel to this, the stair incline. So this is not something that's moving on a breeze. So yeah. that, is, that is some kind of intelligent energy that's moving around, and I, I think that's sometimes how they manifest. They can manifest in different ways. I uh, saw uh, another type of work, which is more your specialty, uh, three weeks ago. I was outside on my porch. It was about 12.30 in the morning, pitch black. I was watching the stars, and I'm not far from the airport, so I, I'm used to seeing aircraft. And this very bright white light, was moving uh, east. I was watching it because I was out there anyways, and it just faded away. But it was it was very large. It was very large. It was very close. I'd say it was only mm, maybe five thousand feet up. Uh, most of the commercial aircraft by in that direction would be about. 8,000 feet. So it was kind of low. It was very large, larger than uh, normal uh, running lights on, on a commercial aircraft. And it just phased out. But I could see this there was a star um, above it and there was a star below it. There was no cloud. And it just phased, phased out. There was no sound to it. And it just phased away. Oh. It's like, the, they are being here. seen. Yeah, they're seen mm -hmm. all over all the time. And, you know, I, they're a whole different subject matter. I think these are very large orbs. Although I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they bring down the smaller orbs just to uh, surveil us. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, they do exist. NASA just put out, um, a, a, I guess, press release thing that they have admitted that they're dealing with some orbs around some project that we have up in space. And their attitude was, well, yes, they're real, but they're not dangerous, so we're not really concerned. I thought, okay, <laughs> but that was the report. Okay. So if the government's yeah, telling you that even they are dealing with them, I think we have an or problem, mm -hmm. and uh, that's yeah. for sure. Now, I was looking at your site today, and mm -hmm. I was a little surprised when I hit the res uh, residual haunting article that I caught on there. Tell us your feelings about, about that. Or well, not we, having feelings about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't, yeah, all the years I've been doing this, I don't see any, um, I don't see any evidence that there's such thing as residual hauntings. Uh, you know, you have to go back to look at the uh, stone tape theory, how, uh, and the stone tape theory is basically on a certain stone or rock, we can record events or emotions or energy and then play it back somehow in the future. And, and it gets um, caught in the loop. 
Yeah, and it gets caught in a loop, and things happen over and over. And I, I don't, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence to it. What I have found in my uh, memory bubble or memory matrix theory is something that will appear to be residual, or a thing may reoccur. But what you have is you actually have a haunting. There's a spirit present. But they're having a memory that's very profound, very emotional to them. Almost like we have daydreams. Yeah. Only their daydream is very emotional and it, 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 it poses some kind of question or, or problem or something to them. And it manifests outside of their being and we perceive it as residual. Well, this woman keeps coming down the stairs at midnight every night. Well, yes, that is a, a manifestation of a memory that the spirit sitting up in your bedroom is having. Oh. They're working out a problem, and it's manifesting, and you're seeing it or hearing it or smelling it or whatever it might be. But it's not residual. Uh, my, my theory goes on to explain... Um, uh, ghost ships, uh, ghost trains, um, you know, these things aren't physically really there. You can't have a, a, a ship that appears as a ghost. What you have is an old sailor who's remembering his ship that sank off the coast and the ship appears. It manifests outside his being and then simply just fades away. Same as wow. a train. You know, the old farmer remembers the 820 going thundering by the farm, you know, and sure enough, his memory manifests that train. And yeah. some kid up on the hill there sees this train and went, wow, I saw a ghost train. Yeah, he did. It's not a residual. It's a, it's a manifestation of a memory that the spirit is having. So we're interfering in some other life form's who has passed over their problem or, or, or took place in their life, and we're just seeing it that's right. along with them, more or less. Yeah. That, that, that's very interesting. Um, also, I, I was reading, and I didn't get to read too much, so I'm going to ask you to you know, explain to us uh, what that's all about. The multiverse um, theory that you have on your site, and I take it that you just think that we're bumping into all these other, you know, universes or life forms and dimensions and crossing back and forth and seeing each other. Is right. that kind of, yeah. Yeah. Well, the multiverse uh, theory, that's brought uh, forward by uh, my technical manager. He's, uh, his name's John Mullen. Uh, he's a smart guy. And... Uh, he came to me with his multiverse theory, and he said, well, yeah, let's put it up on the website, because it you know, makes perfect sense. There's nothing I can argue about. Uh, we put it up there, and what, you know, basically what he's saying is um, the, the, where, we, where, where we exist is basically fluid, and there's all these multiverses around us, and these things bubble and churn and move around, and they bang into each other, and Sometimes when they connect, they have we'll have experiences. We'll see things. We'll see. We'll run into extraterrestrial things. We'll run into ghosts. We'll run into um, strange creatures. And but they're short lived because you know that point will slide away and move away and it, it separates. And then something else will connect, and somebody else will have an experience. So these things are always undulating and moving around. So uh, I'm probably not explaining it as eloquently. No, that was actually a pretty good but, thumbnail uh, sketch. His theory. But um, that's, that's basically the gist of it. There's all these things existing um, all around us, all the time. And I think it's, um, I always believe the separation is, is that frequency. But uh, it's where we make those point contacts that we start uh, running into things. This is the kind of material that I talk to a lot in conversations I have with people who do remote viewing. 
Um, are you familiar with remote viewing, and have you ever um, uh, traded uh, trade stories or anything with with remote viewers, Richard? With who? I'm sorry. What was that? No. Uh, what, what I'm saying is, have you had any conversations with people who do remote viewing? Because the multiverse theory actually fits into uh, what is done by remote viewers as well. In other words, it's based on right. an idea of stacked probabilities in any given what they call a timeline, but it's really just a reality stream. And I'm wondering if right. well, that's something that, that maybe bleeds over into your particular area of inquiry at all. Um, I, I did deal with a remote viewer. Uh, I mean, he, he he sort of blew my mind because uh, I'm sort of uh, hands-on, mm-hmm. show me, prove it to me kind of guy. And uh, he's telling me stuff that, you know, he's doing remote viewing and he's telling me stuff. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so I can tell you stuff too. It doesn't mean it's true. And uh, so he got a call from a girl, which was uh, interesting. I, I was present there. He gets this call from a girl and she says... Uh, uh, and they have this close relationship. So she calls and she goes, listen, I, I, I got an appointment. It's an important appointment. I got to get going. I have to bring a file with me, but I can't find a file. Can you help me? So he goes, hang on. So he goes into this mode. And I'm sitting there. He's got the phone on speaker mode. And I'm sitting there watching him. And he's like concentrating, concentrating. He goes, uh, a blue folder? She goes, yeah. She goes, uh... Okay, down the hall by the phone. It's under the there's there's two manila envelopes. It's underneath there. So I hear her walk in the hall. She goes, "Oh yeah, here it is. That's great. Thanks." Click. And it, and I look at him and I went, "How the hell did you pull that off?" Because <laughs> I told you I'm doing remote viewing. I was in her living room with my son. I'm like, okay. So then I, you know he made me, a, but uh, <laughs> that was pretty weird. Well, the reason I ask the question is because basically there's some commonalities between all the disciplines, and I really appreciate the fact that you're very aware of what you do and what the parameters are on that. But we're, in a sense, in ufology, remote viewing, and paranormal research, we're dealing with non-local, non-chronological, for the most part, events and attempting to draw evidence into our physical reality of these things. And I'm always amazed because Chris and I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of bleed over between the things that we do on this show. They all tend to run in a certain vein, but they tend to cover things like what we're talking about. But it seems like in every discipline, there's a certain amount of bleed over, and yet at the same time, the conversation that I have with Chris and with other people that I I, I, have, I talk with is that we're always dealing with multiple entities, multiple events, multiple um, interactions between matter and something else that we can't put our fingers on. How? And you're really you're really into you know having the two or three witnesses. And I guess my question for you is this. I, I've, I've studied ufology from a distance. I've zoomed in close. Um, and I have the sense that ufology needs to learn something from the discipline of what you and your team do. Do you know a lot about UFO investigators and how they work relative to the, the way you work yourself? Uh, I have... I- I've looked at some some of the uh, information out there. I've looked at some of the investigators. I see how they do their things. They have a very difficult task because uh, unlike myself, where I have uh, an event unfolding real time, I can take my equipment and maybe capture something, they're always getting reports after the fact. Um, They're always seeing witnesses months, even sometimes years after the fact. The memory is not always the greatest thing. Even mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in real time, so they've got an extremely difficult job. Something I wouldn't uh, want to pursue. I mean, uh, the the job they have to take take on is, is phenomenal um, because evidence is going to be extremely 
extremely hard to get. Other than a document that you might find in our archive somewhere, you know, that might be the smoking gun, it's going to be really hard to, to, to prove these things exist. And I hate to say it, but there's so much fakery out there. Yes. When a, a person we don't hate gets to say it. We, yeah. Oh, I know. I, it, it, it just makes me upset to see this stuff because people are they're passionate and they're really working hard to, to do stuff, and then you've got all these guys faking things. So even if you do find a, a tangible piece of evidence that took you an entire lifetime to, to capture, you bring it forward, and there's 700 fakes out there, and people just automatically, you know, the, the skeptics jump on it, go, yeah, okay, so what? One, know, one other advantage, yeah, one other advantage that you have is um, there does seem to be a perceived reality. I'll use that term of paranormal, especially related to what we call ghosts, spirits, hauntings, things like that. Whereas in ufology, certainly here in the United States and in Canada as well, it has been actively opposed and quashed, both as a discipline and even a topic of conversation. The major media is being drug-kicking and screaming into dealing with this only because now the alternative media has brought it so close to the attention of the public, but that wasn't always true. Um, but we have similar daunting tasks in that you know very well that um, there are a huge number of fake operators out there in the, in the paranormal world. We've interviewed other people who have, you know, they spend half their time basically swatting at gnats to keep the frauds away, and the people who are yeah preying on people as well for money and prestige and ego tripping so you know in a lot of ways I, I see the two disciplines as very similar in that respect when you're able to wrap up an investigation in a nice package is that a rare occasion or do you find that you're able to resolve most of your investigations in some way that's satisfactory to yourself and to your clients um, yeah, we usually try and uh, uh, satisfy the client. We try and satisfy ourselves as well. We want to uh, make sure what's there, what's the story behind it. Um, it can't always be done. We, you know, we don't have a hundred percent success rate. Um, you know, these things we're dealing with can be very uncooperative. They don't. They may be silenced. There could be a controlling entity. Uh, we've had controlling entities uh, where one will silence the rest. There might be eight or ten there, but this one dominant one will silence everybody. You're not allowed to talk. You're not going to communicate. You're not going to do anything for these people at all. Um, I've had to go and develop uh, specific techniques to get around those situations. Uh, you know, I, one of the techniques I use is called the uh, divide and conquer. Uh, when we do run into this uh, overbearing entity, I'll split the team into two. We'll set a, li a list of questions that we want answered on paper. I'll give the paper to team uh, one of the teams. I will keep a copy of that paper with myself, and then the teams will split up and go into one team will go into the, the furthest reaches of the property and uh, away from my team, and then we'll start again asking those questions now what happens is that that dominant spirit he can't be in both places at the same time so he's got to pick his battle so what we find is he'll go and try and silence whoever and then you know once we'll start talking so we'll, we'll get that full of information he'll be very upset and there might be a little bit of trouble down the road for us but we're getting the information flow so it's, uh, do, we, do we always get satisfaction? No. What was your most rewarding um, uh, investigation, Richard? And what was your most disturbing or frightening one? Great question, Chris. Oh, my God. That might be another radio show. <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, the uh, <laughs> Well, I think my my the Overshadows Project, the uh, the first book I wrote was uh, probably one of the most rewarding ones. Uh, and I had a 
so much. I, I learned so much on that investigation. But one of the one of the most miraculous things that I, uh, occurred was uh, something that really touched my my uh, my my heart. Was uh, I discovered that uh, certain things, certain triggers, will create an emotional event. Uh, so powerful that the uh, spirits can manifest either in sight, sound, whatever. Uh, it was Christmas, just just before Christmas. Uh, I was at the client's house. They were uh, trying to get their minds off the situation that they were, you know, deep within a, a, a not a very good haunting. Uh, they had some music in the background playing. It was a mixed tape of uh, Christmas music. We were sitting in the kitchen. It's sort of open concept uh, to the living room beyond and an old song came on uh, which was uh, Eva Marie and uh, while the music came on and the, the four of us were sitting in the kitchen we heard this little voice a little girl probably around six or seven years old starting to sing along when she recognized the song and the fact that it was so close to Christmas must have spurred her emotionally. And she started to sing along with the song at the top of her lungs. And the four of us looked at each other because the four of us are the only ones in the house. And we all started to peek around the corner into the into the living room. And then she realized, she must realize, oh, what am I doing? They can hear me. And stopped. But that was, that was extremely... Emotional. It was, it was uh, one of the one of the greatest feelings I ever had is hearing that voice. Mm. But uh, as for the worst of the worst, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> there was many, huh? We're not on a strict well, time limit, so if there's one you want to share, you well, have the share time. That yeah. Time. I think. Well, I did have uh, one of the worst ones was. Um, well, I shouldn't say one of the worst. This was the worst. Oh. And uh, we're getting, this is where you get into the trap. Um, I was invited down to do a, a paranormal investigation. It was another team working in a, a job. Uh, it was a family uh, that had kids. Uh, the mother and father was kids involved. And <laughs> Pardon me. And they... Uh, so they asked me, they said, would you like to come out and have a look and get your opinion? And I said, yeah, sure. So when I met them, went to the house, met the family, had a look around. Um, looked like a bad, typical haunting. Um, you know, there's bad stuff going on. But I mean, sometimes you get spirits that aren't nice. So it looked like a typical haunting that went bad. So we were setting up equipment, we were doing our thing and collecting EVP and photographs and I was setting up surveillance in the basement of the house and I don't like working around kids and I, you know, I spoke to the family and they were going to take the kids and go over to the grandparents' house. So one of the kids came down, a uh, female, she was I think 10 and she just wanted to say goodbye. She, she, she was into this sort of ghost stuff and so anyway, she came midway down the basement stairs and she said we're leaving and I'm going to go and we'll talk later and I said okay take care and she went to turn around and she made this noise and I went okay and I looked at her and I couldn't tell what she was doing but she she had both hands on the handrail of the stairs and all of a sudden her her leg came up off the stair and I could see her pant leg was uh very, very tight around her leg, as if somebody was holding her, her ankle and pull, trying to pull her off the stairs. Now, I'm only a few feet away, but I can't see anything that's around her or attached to her or pulling her, but there's physical evidence that I can see something's going on. So she pulled herself away. She ran up the stairs, screaming, uh, grabbed the door and swung it behind her to close it. And I hear behind her, there's nothing there that I can physically see, but I I hear boom, 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 boom going up the stairs behind her. And then whatever it is, the store swinging closed, 
it hits this door with so f much force that it swings back open and puts the handle through the wall. Now, of course, I've left my camera and I'm starting to run upstairs. And, of course, the team came down, converged down there around her. And they, they took her out of the house. But it was after that that we discovered that it wasn't a typical haunting. There was a, what I call demonic entity uh, made its presence known to us. And that's when uh, everything started to go um, started to go bad for the team and the family. Did you say monarch entity? No, demonic. Demonic and okay, I misheard yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sorry about that. Uh, it made its presence uh, known to us, and um, and it started to, uh, to uh, attack the family's health. Uh, it came to uh, came to our our various houses, came to my house, came to my work, um, oh. came to uh, my team's houses, uh, just to throw a fright into you, just to. You know, pound around or, or uh, do some weird stuff. And, uh, yeah, that, like I said, that team sort of fell apart. They had a hard time dealing with it. Um, where I, uh, uh, well, this is how bad it can get. Is I, uh, like I said, a uh, moment conflict. So I went to, um, I was driving by. The sign caught my eye. It was on the lawn of a church. I was trying to figure out how I was going to deal with this situation. And uh, so I'm driving down the street, and I see this big sign. It's sitting on the, the lawn of a church, and it says, Who's going to save you? And uh, so I, I pulled the car over, went into the church, uh, spoke with the, uh, the priest, told him what was going on. Uh, gave him some information that uh, he automatically looked at me and he said, okay, I, I'll need to get a hold of a, an exorcist for him. And uh, I said, that would be you know, much appreciated. So if you can put me in, in touch with this individual, that would be great. So he, he said uh, he'd get a hold of a, an exorcist. He said, yeah, and he wanted to pray. So I said, okay. So we did some prayer. I thanked him and I headed off went home. So uh, this this guy, this is one of the oldest churches in our area. He's been working out of there uh, faithfully for over 30 years. Um, so the next day he burns the church to the ground. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, so I don't think I'm going to get my exorcist. Uh, <laughs> Oh my the, God! Uh, that's uh, that's amazing. The fire, the fire chief and the police know that he did. He he openly admits saying that he did it. Uh, the church stepped in. Whatever he told the church happened. He did not divulge to the uh, police or the fire chief or the public. But the church says we're not pressing charges. It was our church. If we choose to burn it down, so be it. Um, oh. And they and they took him and they hid him. And they're not pressing charges. And uh, they've taken the property where the church is and they turned it into a little park at. They're not, they're not going to rebuild ever. So, so you really have... That, that, that's just a terrible story. You really need to keep your faith and the faith of your group strong. Uh, as you say, to have clear lines to know how to deal with these things. Otherwise, you, really you could be just taken right over in many ways you know what I mean yeah wow yeah. well it's not a game this is not a game people think that it's no. fun and games but it's not a game uh, there's some serious stakes up there so you, you really need to know and you know I've been doing this for what 35 years I don't I don't know everything I'm gonna make mistakes too so uh, <laughs> you got to be careful what you're doing I don't know what to say. I mean, those—that's a terrible story, and yeah. and it 
proof that you really do not play with this 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 subject matter. I have the same thing in, in with what I do. I can't get across to people this is not a game. It, it's um, nope. very very difficult. And I guess until you tell them terrible stories like the one you just told, uh, they won't mm-hmm. listen. So I guess it's best we do tell them. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all Hollywood. It's all, you know, they're, uh, we're a TV generation, so, you know, uh, it can't be that bad because uh, these things, uh, you bring evidence pushing... forward and they go, yeah, but I saw that, you know, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen stuff created or, uh, on uh, TV. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I think they're pushing the limits of the ridiculousness of these yeah. TV shows about the paranormal to the point where the people are going to start to revolt because they're so bad. And there will be some that are really curious and want to know and start to maybe either turn those shows off or demand better things or go elsewhere. I saw a great show where a bunch of good old boys when hunting for a Bigfoot found it mm-hmm. all in one day found where it lived, found its nest, had a battle with it, had a fist yeah. fight with it, and then yeah. decided to go back to the truck and drive away. Yeah, and that was, it, it was, I mean, it was so, you know, it's so ridiculous. And of course, it's something <laughs> like that, you know. So no, when people no. get their belly full of that, maybe they'll want to really know that, first of all, these aren't things you play with, and secondly, it's, we really need to figure it out to to know more than we do. I think that's yeah. the safe thing to do. Right, that's right. I do wonder that's right. if you're noticing an uptick in paranormal activity as the years go by. Now, you and the Searcher Group have been together since 1979. So you've mm-hmm. done this long enough to have historical and anecdotal evidence and data are you seeing an uptick in activity, or is it because we're now becoming more aware of it? Well, yeah, I, you know, this is something I've looked at over the last ten years, actually, and this is a this is exactly the question that's been on my mind for about ten years. Uh, at first, I thought, well, we're more aware of it, you know, with the uh, with the internet and uh, you know the, the global community and the we're getting more stories from different people. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's possible. Maybe that's the thing. But no, I think in reality, we're, we're experiencing more activity in present day. There seems to be an influx. Not only an influx in uh, paranormal activity with, uh, with the dead, but a lot of intervention from, I will say, um, Angels and demons. Oh, we didn't even go there. Influx. Well, the, this, is, what's this, this is what's uh, showing up on the radar. There seems to be No, more. actually, you're confirming things for me right now. Thank you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're out there, and there, there's more intervention. You know, we have um, uh, people reporting uh, intervention from... Uh, from angels and entities that are helping them uh, or, or helping them get through a traumatic situation or just appearing uh, at the scene of an accident and saying, you know there's what, a report, you're going to be fine. Yeah, there's a report this weekend on the Internet, and I wish I had the link to it. Uh, I'll have to see if mm-hmm. I can find it, of a woman who was dying inside of a car after a severe automobile accident they couldn't get her out with jaws of life. There were multiple, multiple witnesses to this. That a man appeared and said, "I will take care of this," and they were able to pull her out of the car and take her to a hospital. And I'll have to find a link for that story. But it well, was, was that the priest, the no, man that they said he, they thought he was a priest? Okay, you may, I don't that know. saved her. Yeah, well, I'm not sure of all story. the fine details on this, but it caught, yeah, yeah. caught my attention over the weekend. And the reason why I ask you that question, Richard, is because anybody that's done any work in these realms, and like I said, you know, it overlaps, and you have a real good right. sense of your own mission. But I feel we're seeing an uptick. I've said for years, 
based on my own experiences that the veil is thinned, that we are in a time when things are definitely shifting, that there's something happening in the um, fabric of dimensions that is causing an uptick in this kind of paranormal uh, activity. Right. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. This, uh, you know, this is, uh, and that's the end theory of uh, my uh, memory bubbles. Just once the bubbles stop, that's the end game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's Judgment Day. All these uh, little uh, memory bubbles will pop, and you're going to snap into a reality that you're, you're going to uh, have to be judged. You're going to be standing there with everybody else, and uh, it's time to find out who's who. Yeah, yeah. The contrast yeah. has gotten a lot sharper, hasn't it? Um, black and white, good and evil, um, dark and light are definitely beginning to become very obvious if you know people have the eyes to see it. Right. Well, you can't have one without the other. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, oh. So they will always be there. They will, you know. Well, the best thing we can hope for is a balance. And it's when that balance is uh, damaged, uh, that's when trouble starts. And uh, I, it's no different in a, in a haunting. Um, people ask me, do you remove spirits? And I say, absolutely not. I never go into a house and banish a spirit from a house or try and remove them from, from a property. And the reason is, is I've discovered that there's more, there's usually more than just one at, at a property. You can have two, three, seven, twelve, who knows how many are there. <laughs> but, yeah, legion, um, basically. What happens, yeah, it, 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 right, but there's usually a balance. Mm -hmm. And what happens in a situation is because they are social, uh, if you go stormy in there and you put up a, uh, you know, uh, cause a situation and say, hey, I want you guys out of here, get out. Everybody's supposed to be out. Well, think of it this way. Say you came home at 2 in the morning and your kids were having a party and you were upset and you stormed into the house and you said, get out, everybody out. Well, who's going to leave first? It's going to be the polite ones. It's going to be the respectful ones. They're going to go, hey, this guy doesn't want us here. Okay, no problem. They leave. Well, that's great. But hold on a second. Way off in the corner in the shadow, what's that brooding guy doing? He's just standing there. Now, you don't realize he's there. And you go to the family, okay, I took care of your ghost problem, no problem, everything's cool. And you leave. Well, hold on. That guy has got nothing but no good on his mind. And now there's no one to keep him in check. All mm -hmm. the good ones left. Mm -hmm. So, guess what's going to, you're going to get a call from this family two weeks from now going, wow, it's worse now. Everything's crazy. We're gonna, we're, you know, we're living in a hotel. We can't even go back to the house. Well, how do you fix that? <laughs> you can't go find the other ghost and say, listen, can you go back and take care of this guy? <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. So we never do that stuff. We'll try and negotiate. We'll try and open communications, find out what the issue is, and negotiate. We've been very successful that way. But I don't remove things. That's not my place. Have, have you ever told people, just leave? This is so bad here, and there's so much activity, and so many players. If I was you, I would just move? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, wouldn't that be a twice. solution for some of these kids? Yes. Wow. How do you I like that? that? Twice. Yeah, that's happened twice. Get out. <clears throat> We're not kidding. One was uh, the situation I just told you about with the uh, yeah. with the church and the, the family. I, that was, uh, I didn't see a, any other solution. Not that it helped. I didn't, did I, they speak out? Just, uh, they what did. With them? Uh, yeah, what one of them? The only time it did work was uh, actually in the first book. Uh, I told them to, to move out. They did move out, and then the, the, the haunting subsided. Stayed with um, the place. But, you know, that was over 10 years ago, and I've been back to this house uh, recently, and it's still going on. It's still out. Oh, my goodness. So... Yeah. Uh, there's just nobody. Nobody stays more than three, four months at this place. It's just well, 
if there's one thing that I have been convinced of tonight is that we need to have Richard to come back for another show. We absolutely do. In the near future. He just told us he can do at least right. three more hours. So I'm right. Well, he's he's exhausted. <laughs> I know because we've been making him talk. So the only cure for that is to make him come back and do it all over again. <laughs> Perfect solution. Anytime. Richard is as, as we're going out tonight. Uh, one more time, give out the website and any information you want to leave our listeners with. Yeah, it's uh, www.thesearchergroup.ca. Uh, the searcher group is all one word. And, uh, yeah, please feel free. Go have a look at the website. If you wish to contact me, leave a story, ask questions, uh, share something, that would be, uh, that would be awesome. And I appreciate that. Hey, thank you so much for coming on tonight with us. And uh, we're going to be back again next week. And thanks as well tonight to Chris. Chris, you uh, you really, this was your interview, and it was uh, really fun to sit back and listen to your work. Our guest well, next... I just yeah, go loved ahead. talking to Richard. So it was a, a easy, you know, insightful, interesting, knowledge-filled night for me. He just blows my mind. <laughs> So I, I well, would talk rich to, to death, and I don't want to do that. That's the secret to a good show, <laughs> and it was tonight. Thank you both so much. Uh, next week, Billy Booth UFO Casebook will be here, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, off Planet Radio. dot net, off Planet Radio. dot com. Check the websites. There's new material uh, scheduled to go up very soon. Uh, an interview I just did with Courtney Brown, and we will be back next week. This is All Planet Radio. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep searching for it.